Whether heading across the country or taking a weekend getaway, people love to travel. Regardless of the destination, it's impossible to leave home without luggage. Luggage is made from all kinds of materials, including wood, metal, plastic, high-tech polycarbonates, and leather. Not all leather overnight bags are created equal. This dark brown bag was constructed with the capacity to hold water. The process starts with full grain hides, chrome tanned by an outside facility. Chrome tanning is an effective treatment which allows the leather to become more water resistant. This bag is constructed from a single piece of leather, making it more durable and watertight. First, a leather worker uses a template to cut out the shape of the bag. He uses a machine to shave the edges off the piece of leather in a process called skiving, which prepares the leather for folding and sewing. Using a hole punch, another craftsman taps the series of openings for riveting on buckles and other attachments. The holes will prevent the opening from ripping. Next, a leather worker uses a template to mark where he'll apply a strip of glue to the top edge. He attaches a polyester strip to the bottom edge of the glue and spreads more glue on top of the polyester. Then he folds and hammers the top portion of the leather over onto the polyester strip. Once complete, the leather worker trims the edges of the polyester. The leather is then placed into a machine known as a clicker to stamp out the bag straps and other leather components. The clicker works by applying 25 tons of pressure to custom-made dies. The shoulder pad is one of 22 pieces of leather that will complete the bag. A craftsperson glues a foam rectangle between two layers of leather. This type of glue won't bubble in hot temperatures. Chrome tanned hide is tough stuff, so manufacturers use a heated stamp to brand the leather with their logo. A leather worker uses a sewing machine to piece together multiple parts of the leather. The stitching perforations weakens the leather, so for added strength, the craftsman uses a heavy gauge continuous filament polyester thread. Next, a craftsman attaches the buckles. He places one steel rivet in each buckle piece and secures it into place. He leaves the remaining rivets out to accommodate the sewing machine, which will reinforce the attachment. The buckles are made of high strength 316 stainless steel. A craftsman attaches a piece of plastic to reinforce the handle and prevent the leather from becoming misshapen over time. Once he's glued in pieces of plastic to each handle opening, the leather worker finishes all the seams. This type of continuous filament polyester thread is the same kind that is used to sew parachutes together. Next, a craftswoman cleans the completed bag and applies a generous amount of leather milk to condition the leather. The leather milk is made of all-natural, non-toxic ingredients. The craftswoman uses a torch to singe off any stray hairs before the strap is attached to a set of upper or lower D-rings. This versatile bag can now be worn as a backpack or a shoulder bag. Stylish and durable, this leather overnight bag is built to hold your stuff while you travel to any destination. 
Air hockey was developed in the late 60s and early 70s by a group of American billiard engineers. When in play, the puck floats on a thin cushion of air, propelled by players at each end. With no friction, the puck moves fast, making air hockey a high-speed game. In a game of air hockey, the puck levitates ever so slightly, made possible by a constant flow of air flowing through perforations in the playfield. The playfield is made from a laminated composite material that's been printed with air hockey graphics. A computerized drill cuts into three playfields at once in the same consistent pattern. The size of the holes are a little larger than pinholes, creating over 4,600 perforations in each air hockey playfield. An automated tool carves grooves in a sheet of medium-density fiberboard. The board will serve as a base for the playfield. Air will circulate in the grooves and exit through the playfield holes. Next, sawdust is blasted out of the grooves. The grooves fiberboard moves through a glue applicator. The rubber roller coats the top of the board with a small amount of glue so it doesn't seep into the grooves. As the board exits, technicians move the board onto a stack. Once the board is in the correct position, the laminate is applied and aligned with the grooves in the fiberboard. A cardboard cover is placed on the laminate for protection as the stack moves through a press. The weight of the press squeezes the stack together, ensuring adhesion as the glue cures. Meanwhile, a craftswoman applies stick-on graphics onto the side apron boards. She opens a pre-cut slot for a coin door and exposes a hole for a bolt. She cuts open a slot for maintenance access and removes the panel that will serve as a door. She numbers the door in the side apron piece so she can match them up later during installation. After applying artwork to the end panels, another technician assembles curved corner parts and links metal brackets to the side apron parts. He installs a bracket for a puck deflector in the center of the end panel and screws down the corner connectors. He sets the end panels in an upside down position on the work surface and attaches the side boards to the corner connectors. This completes the table apron. A locked door is installed in the plywood floor. This will serve as an interior storage compartment. Next, a craftsman installs the coin door and secures it into place. He mounts wire speakers that project sound effects to a computerized optical system that tracks the puck's movements. Once the structure is fitted with wooden panels, the game's flashing lights and sensor activators are installed. At another station, a team flips a playfield over to work on the back. One technician attaches a board above the open grooves, creating a chamber for airflow. The motor and fan are installed over the small opening. This system will blow air into the grooves and the playfield perforations. The playfield is turned over and lowered onto the table structure. Next, aluminum bumpers are attached to the table's border as a barrier for the puck during play. A technician installs goal puck deflectors on the ends and screws in metal plates over the deflector cups. He installs a lock on each goal compartment so no one can steal the puck. Finally, 
The air hockey table assembly is complete. Let the games begin.